get started today we are going to continue what we have discussed last time uh, so we were talking about the uh, fourth criterion in order to select the material we say that we have a number uh, of uh, criteria in order to select the material for uh, uh, construction purposes and uh, we stop at uh, uh, the fourth criterion so the fourth criterion is the uh, production and the construction uh, so it is very important criterion because uh, sometimes the material is going to be uh, suitable for your work but the way uh, uh, you should produce the material is going to be uh, difficult so for example let's say that you have you want to uh, construct a large curve with uh, certain uh, uh, capabilities and you are going you are, you, you, you are intended to use the wood so sometimes the uh, availability and the ability to fabricate uh, fabricate a wood in a large curve it may be difficult so you may change your option so production is very important and it's mean that the availability and the ability to fabricate material into desired shapes and also we have the construction itself uh, let's say that i intended to use the steel I want to use the steel in order to construct my my building and uh, uh, let's say the labors uh, I don't have any uh, trained labors in my region so in that case the construction process is going to be difficult because you don't have uh, trained labors in order to handle your construction so construction it means the ability to build the structure on the site Sometimes not all the uh, materials are suitable in order to build them on the site. So the production and the construction uh, uh, very important uh, 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 criteria in order to uh, use uh, a suitable material. Also, we have the aesthetics characteristics. The aesthetic characteristics it means that it means uh, the appearance of the material, how beautiful the, the material is going to look, and. Uh, this uh, the um, uh, in order to choose the aesthetic properties the uh, architect is going to be responsible for that but even though the ar architect is going to be responsible for the appearance of the material we as civil engineers we need to make sure that uh, the material uh, is com compatible with the structural requirements and uh, uh, it's very important to uh, talk about the material variability so uh, let's say that i have three samples for uh, the same material so i have i, I need let's say that uh, i need or i want to choose uh, the steel in order to construct something then i need to test the the steel itself so i'm going to take three samples in order to see the stress and the strain of the steel i have some uh, sample one sample two and sample three i apply attention for these three samples and you you may say that the value of the stress the maximum stress is going to be the same for the three samples but in practical that is not true you are going to have variance between sample one sample two and sample three so all the materials they have uh, variabilities so and that variabilities uh, uh, in some material are more uniform than the others so let's say that I'm going to test the steel. Let's say the, the, the maximum failure here came out to be 500 megapascal. The second one, uh, 499 megapascal. And the last one, uh, 501 megapascal. The uh, results are close, but we have variability. Let's say that I'm going to test concrete. If I'm going to test concrete, then the difference between the three samples is going to increase a little bit. If I'm going to uh, do the same thing for the wood, again, the difference or the variability in the sample is going to be larger. So I need to know that all materials have variability. They are not going to give you the same value of the stress for each sample. And the reason for that, first, I have the nature of the material itself. So the nature of the wood is totally different than the nature of the steel. And also the sampling process. How did you uh, get your sample? 
and also the testing itself. Sometimes your uh, setting is going to be different than other technician. So we have three sources of variance. Of variance. We have the uh, nature of the material, we have the sampling process, and we have the testing process. And we need to use good sampling. The sampling process should be good, and the testing also should be uh, uh, conducted in good manner so that we are going to minimize those variabilities. Also, in order to understand the variability uh, of the material, we need to understand two main concepts. We have the precision and we have the accuracy. We are going to say that, for example, you are precise and you are accurate. So we are going to describe to describe our result as a precise result or an accurate result. result. We have difference between the precision and accuracy. Let's say that I have three samples here for uh, a certain material, and uh, I test the first material and the second material and the third material. And let's say that here I have the, the target uh, for my result. Assume that the region here uh, represents the true value. So the, two, the true value uh, lies within this region here. So the first sample, let's say, came uh, the result came out to be here the second uh, sample came out to be here the third came out to be here so you can notice that the result are so close from each other but we have a problem here those results are away from the true value even though i'm going to uh, get close results but all of the results are away from the true value we are going to say that uh, we have precise result precise precise result it means that you are going to measure many times and get exactly or almost the same result so here we got almost the same result but all of those results are away from the true uh, value which is here so we are going to say that we have a bias my result is precise but i have bias bias that mean i have tendency to the diavate in one direction from the true value. In other words, that means my result uh, is inaccurate. My result is inaccurate, not accurate result. Uh, let's go to the uh, uh, C here, the, to the figure C. In figure C, we tested samples. All of the results were close from each other, and they are uh, uh, within the uh, uh, true uh, uh, region. So the true region is here. So I can describe this result as precise and accurate. Then what about the figure B? In figure B, I have uh, results here. The result away from each other, but all of them lies within the uh, uh, true region. So I'm going to say that my result is not precise, but they are accurate. So I can describe the uh, first figure, figure A here, I'm going to say I have pre uh, the, my result uh, precise but not accurate. Regarding number B, my result is accurate but not precise. Regarding the C, we have uh, the, my results are precise and accurate. Because many times in variabilities, we are going to test samples. We are going, we are going to see this a lot. So it's very important to understand the concept of precision and accuracy. Regarding the sampling, here we talk about the sampling process, right? So in the sampling process, let's say that I have uh, aggregates here. I have aggregates. In order to use uh, the aggregates, I need to take sample, right? So how I'm going to take the sample? Should it be from here or from there? What are the conditions in order to uh, get good sampling? They say that the proper sampling must ensure that a random and representative sample is taken from the population or the stockpile. Here I have a stockpile, and in order to take a sample, I have two conditions. First, the sample should be random. Random it means it has uh, an equal chance of being selected, and also it should be representative 
which means that uh, the uh, the sample should be uh, average of the entire stockpile. So I have uh, conditions in order to get good sampling. Later on, we'll learn how uh, uh, to take the uh, sampling in order to test the aggregate. Uh, we talk a lot about how to generate stress strain diagram. And in order to do that, I need devices in the laboratory in order to help me to uh, measure, for example, the time and the deformation and uh, the force, right? So I cannot generate the stress 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 strain diagram unless I have devices in order to measure uh, those parameters. And we are going to classify the uh, devices in the laboratory into two uh, categories. I have direct devices like the ruler. If I'm going to use the ruler here, directly I'm going to measure the uh, uh, parameter. Also, I have the dial gauge. This one here is a dial gauge. Also, directly I'm going to be able to measure uh, the deformation. For example, here I have the caliper. I think most of you saw, saw the caliper in the physics lab. So we are going to call this direct devices because directly I can I can measure the uh, uh, property. While the other one, those one here, we are going to call them indirect devices like LVDT. We call this LVDT, and this one is the strain gauge, and this one here is the load cell. The LVDT and the strain gauge. We are going to use them in order to, to, to determine the deformation while the load cell in order to determine the force. Those, we call these indirect devices because they are not directly measuring the, the uh, properties. Uh, they are going to measure the changes in electric voltage and then they, uh, they, they is going to be related to the deformation and the stress and the strain, which means that I need to make calibration for them because they are not directly measuring the parameters. Actually, they are measuring the changes in the electric, electric uh, voltage. And then uh, they should be calibrated in order to give us the deformation, the stress, and the strain. The good thing about the indirect devices, they can be, uh, uh, they have sensors, and they can be easily connected to dig digital devices or computers. So those devices here, uh, I can connect them to computers in order to measure uh, uh, the result on screen. While those one, I cannot do that with the direct devices. So uh, let's talk about the dial gauge. The dial gauge look like that, look like a lock, uh, clock here. So the purpose of the uh, dial gauge, let's say that I have simple support beam and I apply concentrated force. So at that point, I'm going to get the maximum deflection. So that point is going to go down. I'm going to use that device because I'm going to fix that device here. When the deflection is going to uh, uh, take place, that means that point is going to go here and it's going to hit the device. And as a result, you, you see this, this one here is going to, to move. And I can directly uh, measure the deflection. So dial gauges are used in many laboratory tests to measure the deformation. The dial gate is attached at two points. So I have point one and I have point two between the relative movement is measured. So I need to measure the relative movement here. Also, I have the uh, linear variable differential transformer, LVDT. Again, this one here, we are going to use them in order to measure the deformation. I'm going to uh, put the device here. I'm going to fix that point and that point. And uh, as the deflection is going to take place, uh, the, the, this device here is going to be shorter. And as a result, I'm going to measure the changes in the electric voltage. And then you see that wire here, it should be connected to a computer device in order to uh, see the deformation. Also, we have the strain gauge. The strain gauge is very small and it's attached to the uh, uh, sample here. And this one is going to uh, measure the uh, uh, deformation within 
this length only. And of course, uh, if I'm going to measure the uh, length within this region, I can uh, correlate it to the whole uh, uh, length of the specimen. Again, I have small wire here. It should be uh, uh, connected to computer device. And in order to measure the force, we say that if I'm going to have simply supported beam, I need to put uh, LVDP or uh, a dial gauge in order to measure the uh, deformation but also i need to put a device in order or in order to measure the uh, the force so let's say that i apply concentrated force here i should put uh, a device in order to measure the uh, uh, load i have two types i have the proven ring this one consists of a circular uh, uh, it could be made for uh, iron or aluminum this one here and like you can see here, I'm going to apply the load. And as I'm going to apply the load, the diameter is going to change. It's going to be elliptical. Okay. So as the diameter is going to change, the device here is going to measure the change of the diameter. And that change is going to be correlated to the uh, uh, force. And this one here, this one is manual one. It's not going to be connected to any uh, uh, computers while the load cell here this one is going to be uh, set up at that point and this one is going to measure the change in the uh, electric uh, electric uh, voltage and like you can see i can connect the uh, load cell from uh, this point here to a computer so normally in order to test a beam let's say that i have simple supported me a beam and i need to uh, measure the uh, force and to measure the deformation, I'm going to put load cell here uh, under the force and should be connected to a computer device. And also uh, at the deflection point, uh, I'm going to uh, set up LVDT. And again, it should be connected to a computer device in order to simultaneously measure the load and the deformation. And you should be able to generate a graph between the force and the deflection. Similarly, for all the materials, if you want to uh, measure the uh, uh, stress and the strain, you need to use those devices in order to generate the stress-strain diagram. We say that the stress-strain diagram is fundamental uh, to uh, uh, understand the behavior of the uh, material. Okay. So uh, uh, I'm going to stop here uh, regarding the first chapter. I'm going, I'm going to give you a chance to ask questions, then we are going to move to new topics.